It's hard in the moment when the suffering, when the pain is happening, but if we can just sort of take a moment sometimes in that stillness and, and listen for what God is doing in us, what, what is God doing through this pain? He's not, he's not thrusting this pain on us. He's not sort of targeting us and saying, well, I want to give you this pain or this hardship, but he's always there working in that pain and in that suffering. And so when we can stop for a moment in that stillness and listen for what he's doing and how he's working in us, we can begin to grow from that pain. Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this gathering of Mamas in Spirit. And today is the first day that the everything in my opening has struck my heart the most everything because today I feel like we're kind of in a sense covering everything because we're talking about infertility and this is a topic and a dynamic that we've touched upon in Mamas and Spirit but never just specifically looked at and put before us in front of the Lord and before we begin I just want to say I am an infertile woman and my husband and I have been married for 20, almost 22 years, and we have never been pregnant. And so Mamas in Spirit is for all of us, including for me, because I know that this will touch my heart and help me. So I want to thank so much Anne Koshute from Springs of the Desert for being here today. Thank you, Lindy. It is my pleasure to be with you. You know what, Anne, I love, and we chatted over the phone a few days ago for just a little bit, is I love that in our suffering that Lord, the Lord takes away any of our layers or any of our masks or anything else and helps us just to meet and greet one another as we are created by God. Yeah, that is one of the interesting and unusual blessings that can come from our suffering. It's a hard thing to learn. But once we kind of open ourselves to the possibility that our suffering can offer, and that even sounds strange to say, um, but it's so true. God can bring such beautiful fruit and even friendships through our suffering. Yes. Beautiful redemption. Thank you, Anne, already. And in that spirit and in the Holy Spirit, will you please open us in prayer? I'd be happy to. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving Jesus, we thank you so much for this time together to share as sisters in Christ. We ask you to pour out your love and your mercy into each of our hearts. And we ask you especially to be present to us, to help us to know that we are your beloved daughters. Lord, lead us, guide us, show us the beauty within us, the beauty of your image in us. Heal us in our suffering and help us to be always grateful because you love us so deeply and so intensely. Lord, we thank you for this time and we pray through the intercession of your Holy Mother, and our mother, Mary. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Anne. And already that beautiful prayer reveals your heart and the sacredness of your own heart, Jesus in you. Thank you for that. I would love for you to start at the beginning, really, of your story, of your own story of infertility, and then eventually we can explore Springs of the Desert and how that came to be. Yep, sure. So um, it's interesting because I think my story begins um, with how I grew up, how I was raised in a small town um, in northeastern Pennsylvania, really steeped in the faith. I'm the youngest of two, and my parents really instilled in my brother and I a strong um, sense of the love of God and of our faith. I'm a cradle Byzantine Catholic. That's a whole other show we could do probably. <laughs> so, you know, I grew up with that strong faith, but like many people, I think, who go off to college, who are young adults and are just trying to kind of feel their way around, um, I had this period of time, and it really lasted all through my 20s, 
where I really felt disconnected from God and and from my faith. I think the fact that my parents had instilled that faith in us so deeply is what ended up sort of pulling me back later on. But at the time, my relationship, I, I don't even think I could call it a relationship with God, was one of if I do certain things for him, he will return by doing the things that I want. And so um, so I was kind of steeped in that sort of relationship with God until I actually met a group of friends who were Catholic and very faith-filled and had a deep influence on me. And, and I had a real conversion experience probably around the age of 30, I guess a reconversion where I discovered a relationship with God that I had not known before, when I really began to discover that I I am a daughter of God, that he loves me and that he's not an overlord, but he wants what is best for me. He wants me to flourish. And I think that sort of metanoia that I experienced, that conversion that I experienced, I can look back on now and see as a kind of preparation God was beginning already to prepare me for what would come later on in in my marriage and in this suffering that you mentioned of of infertility. So after I had this conversion experience, the Holy Spirit sent me to the John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family to get a master's in theology. I still don't know why. I just think he must have a great sense of humor to choose me. I I don't know. But that was a really formative experience for me. And so I'm getting very steeped in the beautiful teachings of our church and especially of John Paul II on marriage and family. And I'm saying, yes, Lord, this is what I want. But it took years and years and years and it wasn't happening. I wasn't wasn't finding uh, that person that I felt God really had out there for me somewhere, I really felt called to marriage. And so that created its own sort of suffering as I prayed and I waited and I said, Lord, this is my desire. And, you know, I really feel like this is what you're calling me to. Wh- where is this person? And so it wasn't until I was about 42 years old that I actually met my husband. And, you know, I can look at that now as one of those miracles that God produced in my life at just the right time with just the right person, and that I was at the right place to receive him. So I I sort of look back on all of those experiences of being steeped in the faith, kind of wandering away and coming back. And I can see how the Lord was really preparing me through all of that for what was, I think, going to be sort of the biggest challenge and the biggest suffering that I've ever faced in my life. Yes. Thank you, Anne. And so many things you've already shared strike my heart. And one of them is is that you and I are both middle-aged, which I didn't know about you. (laughs) You look much younger than me, Anne. So but- do you. you. No, I was going to say, <laughs> I didn't know it about you either. So, But we are, we are not far apart in age. And so in these podcasts, we often focus on one piece of our story. Yet you've already shared about one of the deepest longings and desires of your heart to get married. And I've witnessed other people I love waiting a very, very long time to meet they're beloved. They're Joseph, the one that they're called into to the covenant of marriage. And so I just want to touch on that, not to explore that story right now, but more just so that we can all be reminded that our lifetimes are pilgrimages and that sometimes the deepest desires of our heart are met, like this one that was met with your husband. But at other times, God has a different plan and a plan of even deeper surrender. And from what you've already spoken, maybe even that involves more pain. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, again, when you look at these things in hindsight, you know, in the moment, there's pain. 
right? And there might be confusion or frustration, God, what are you doing? Or God, where are you? But when you can look back at these things in hindsight, you can see how maybe um, you weren't ready for what God had planned for you in the moment. I know for, for myself, there was a lot that needed to be sort of purged from me. There was a lot of work that God was doing on my heart to make me ready to receive this beautiful gift of my husband. And then, of course, once you get married, you know, that process continues, right? And it, it you know, now you're sort of going through that together. Um, and so, yeah, it's hard in the moment when the suffering, when the pain is happening. But if we can just sort of take a moment sometimes in that stillness and and listen for what God is doing in us. What what is God doing through this pain? He's not he's not thrusting this pain on us. He's not sort of targeting us and saying, "Well, I want to give you this pain or this hardship." But he's always there working in that pain and in that suffering. And so, when we can stop for a moment in that stillness and listen for what he's doing and how he's working in us, we can begin to grow from that pain. We can begin to grow from that pain. That's very beautiful, Anne. So as you entered into your marriage, and I imagine you and your husband shared the hope of having children, and that was not happening, how did you enter into that? How did you enter into that pain? Yeah, so we definitely had that expectation. So I shared at the beginning that I'm the youngest of two. Well, my husband is the youngest of 16. <gasps> so, yeah, that's the reaction that we always get from that. And and he's I'm a exposed twin. to a lot of very large mm-hmm. families here now in Tennessee, but that one takes the cake. <laughs> yep. Yep. 16. And so, yeah, we had we had those expectations. Now, of course, by the time we married, I was 44 and um you know, we sort of knew that I was older, it would be a little bit more difficult, but I think we sort of entered in naively and we thought, okay, it might take a little bit of extra time, you know, but it's going to happen. And I think back to that time when when I was far away from God and I came back to him and some of those same feelings began to kind of stir in my heart as it as the months were going by and it wasn't just a little bit harder it it seemed like it was impossible for us to get pregnant and so I began to revert to that old way of relating to God. And, you know, my husband and I certainly prayed and I prayed, but I found now I can see that that my prayers were very transactional. I was in a negotiation with God and I, it was sort of me saying, okay, God, you know, I, I lived my life in a certain way that was far from you, but I came back and now I've been doing everything right. Don't I deserve to get what it is that I want? Um, and make no mistake, the desire for a child is is wonderful. It's good. I mean, God implants that, you know, in us, and it's a good desire. But if we're not careful, we can let that desire overtake us. And that's, I think, what was happening with me. The, the good desire was becoming a, a source of a source of pain because it was going unfulfilled and then it became my, you know my relationship with my husband began to become one of okay this is you know this is our job this is what we have to do we have to chart I have to take these pills or do these injections or get this test and and it it became a job, and I can I can see now that in many ways I objectified my husband to a certain degree. I objectified this image of the child, right? Because it became a goal that I I was trying to attain, and I wasn't seeing the child so much as a gift. And I think I was objectifying myself too. If I can just take the right pills get the right test, see the right doctor, even if I pray to the right saint or do the right novena, 
this will happen for me. And so um, I really got, I think, sort of caught up in this, um, you know, kind of in this, this whirlwind of my own, um, not just pain, but a really kind of self-centered place where I was just focused on me and what I wanted. And so that was a very difficult period of time, probably somewhere around, um, you know, the second or third year that we were trying unsuccessfully. I too have never been pregnant. So it was, it was hard. It was really hard. Yes. And thank you for for sharing that because whether or not listeners have actually experienced infertility or other things, we all go through seasons that are extremely difficult in our lives and and sometimes for the same reasons and sometimes for different reasons. So I so appreciate how you just shaped out a period of time, really a couple years in your life. And while our infertility stories are very different because my husband was so sick that I was focusing so much on his survival. And then we dove into adopting older children right away who have special needs and there's mental health stuff there and whatnot. It was so busy, not that the pain of the infertility wasn't still there, um, but it's just so different. But other couples who have been infertile have shared with me these stories of, really creating or making what is meant to be that that deep bond of intimacy and union into more of an objectification to meet the end goal of having a child and and it creates a lot of friction in a marriage as well and i say that in all humility because we've had our own friction <laughs> but just yeah. for different reasons <laughs> But I I appreciate you saying that because what I'm hearing from you is that when we kind of glom on and focus on our plan and try to control our plan that we want to unfold, sometimes the pain and the suffering becomes more vast and more layered. I think that's a great insight. I hadn't thought of that, but I think you're right. I think we we begin to um, to magnify our pain to such an extent that we can't see where God is bringing about fruit in our lives. We can't, we can't see um, sometimes the value of, of our own marriages. I remember that at one point, I, I mean, I was just so distraught and crying. And I remember that my husband came to me and, and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, am I not enough for you? And that was one of many kind of wake up calls that I've had throughout walking this path. And, you know, I'm, I so appreciate that he said that because, um, it, it really kind of snapped me out of that, that haze of just thinking about myself and my own pain. And it also shows that, you know, men or husbands deal with, this particular loss of fertility in different ways than we do. So my husband wasn't expressive and he still isn't expressive in the way that I am, but there have been moments of real vulnerability that he has shown me. And that was one of them. And it reminds me that even though he doesn't sort of act or express the same way that I do doesn't mean that it's any less painful for him. And I think in many ways, the pain for him is more about me and seeing me in my suffering. Not that he did not strongly desire that we would have a child, but to see me in that kind of pain, I think was most difficult for him. And it took a while for me to understand that. And now I see that as just such a beautiful expression of, of his love for me. And I cherish that. Yes, it is a beautiful expression of his love for you. And thank you for sharing such an intimate moment from your marriage. And what I'm hearing from you is that you were very foggy, which I'm imagining all of us can relate to when we get into the haze and the fog of sorrow or fear, or anxiety or confusion, and then God reveals God's self and snaps us to a more holy perspective, hopefully. And sometimes because someone is courageous enough because vulnerability takes courage 
to speak truth. And your husband, he spoke a beautiful truth in that moment. That's so dear. And my goodness, I wonder all of us in some way could ask ourselves that. And if we treat, if we're married, our husbands or even other people, other beloveds in our family, as if they are enough. Yeah, that's that's so true. Yeah, I'm so grateful that he was able to express that to me. And um, I think that was really one of those points which brought us a lot closer together. As you know, I mean, marriage is is a pilgrimage. Sometimes it's a little bit of a battle, right? You know, but I think we have these moments along the way that God kind of parts the clouds a little bit and the light shines down and we say, oh, okay, I, you know, I understand. I see, I see this. I see how, um, I see this person's perspective or I see how I might need, you know, to change or to open myself up or to be vulnerable. And so we're still having those experiences, even though now we are at the point where we are past uh, childbearing, but some of that grief still lingers and it comes up when, whenever it comes up, you mentioned how your infertility experience is different. I mean, there are so many different experiences, um, that everyone has and different ways that it impacts our marriages and our other relationships. But I think the one thing that, that holds all of us together who, wherever we are on this particular infertility path is that we can have this sense of isolation. We can have this sense even of shame, especially when we go to church on Sunday and we might see pews all around us that are filled with with large families. Uh, Maybe not 16 kids, but, but even one or two children. And we feel, I think in some ways, so radically other can really feel like we don't belong. And as my infertility path, as I continued along on it, uh, that's how I began to feel. I I really began to feel very isolated and shameful, especially with, with my husband's family, not that they made me feel or intentionally made me feel that way, but I just felt so inadequate because here was a family that, that I came into that was so fruitful. And I felt like I was I felt like I was a desert, quite honestly. I so appreciate you saying that because I'm realizing that here you married a man from 16 children. And I say this also in all humility because I it is the same for me, but you could not bear one. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like for you? You talked about that feeling of being radically different and isolated. What did that look like for you? How did you walk through that with God? It was humbling. It was frustrating. I felt angry. I felt jealous. I felt really sad. And I felt, I guess, in some ways, like a failure. I felt like I failed my husband. I felt like I was failing my family. I wasn't making my parents into grandparents. I I guess I felt sort of like a failure as a woman. And I began to, in some ways, I think, question that sort of daughterhood of God, right? Like, Lord, you know, you've brought me through so many things, um, so many difficulties in my life, so many places where I thought I might walk away from you forever. And you always called me back you know, what are, what are you doing in my life right now? What does this mean? What does it mean that, that I cannot be a mother or at least that I can't be a mother in the way that, that I want to? And so there were a lot of heart to hearts with God. There may have been some yelling. It wasn't him. It was me. <laughs> you know, I got really honest with the Lord. And, and I think that's something for all of us, whether it's infertility or whatever is going on in your life, I am a firm believer that we need to take it all to him and that he is a big God and he can handle it. And there's nothing we can say. There's no way that we can sort of lash out like petulant children or, you know, angry people that he hasn't heard. He already knows it. But he wants us to express that. He wants us to let that out. And so I did. 
And I think what then happened is that he put someone um, in my path, a friend who I reconnected with, he put her in my path at just the right time. And that encounter really ended up changing things for me um, in a big way, ways that I couldn't have expected. I have a feeling you're moving towards the springs and the desert part, yeah. the spring part, because you've really shared so beautifully with us about the desert. And I love how you talked about honesty and authenticity because that's so much at the heart of Mamas in Spirit and why we have these conversations, because I think that a lot of these rocks are unturned in people's hearts and in their lives. And and it's through that authenticity and through that sharing both with God directly and with one another that we heal so that the springs can come, so new life can come, and so that God's plan can unfold in our lives. And I think one of the great dangers of us not doing that is what you've touched upon, which we've had as well in our family life and our marriage together, Brian and me, is that when we don't bring it all to the cross and we don't heal, we tend to either make it greater and or smear it upon one another. There's some great quote or saying that I have no idea what it is, but the point of it, (laughs) (laughs) but the point of it is that when we when we don't deal with our wounds, we we spread and smear that woundedness onto others, and especially those we love the most. So there's there's kind of two parts of it, but the biggest part of it, I think, is just that we are God's daughters, and God loves us so much that God wants us there, and God wants all of us. And I love how you spoke of questioning your belovedness by God or your daughterhood of the Lord, because I have a very different journey in the sense that I was not raised in a a home of faith and I became Catholic older. So I would say my entire lifetime has been a discovery of my daughterhood of God's. At the same time, I do think that there was a piece of me that's so sad that felt undeserving of, of birthing a child, of being pregnant and having that sacred and holy experience. And I hope for listeners, just like with myself, I have these moments coming back to me through your beautiful sharing and of, of those moments of, of feeling radically different and like, I didn't belong in a, in a way, even though, of course, we all profoundly belong, but this is our humanness and our brokenness, and praise God, God heals this, of, of not belonging because I couldn't bear a child like other women could. And like you said, sometimes I'll ask women, oh, like what baby is this for you? And it's the ninth mm-hmm. baby. And I just, I can't even wrap my mind nope. around that, but praise God for that. So, so for you, Anne... From, from this desert that you've, you've shared with us and from this longevity and this really long-term suffering and then meeting this friend again that I, I remember goes all the way back to studying at JP2. And what happened there and how did these waters and this new life begin to come? Yeah, that's right. So we're still sort of navigating um, infertility, still trying, going through treatments, getting increasingly frustrated. But I went to a conference at Notre Dame and I happened to reconnect with a friend from the JP2 named Kimberly Henkel. And we were sitting with each other at the banquet and um, the keynote speaker was talking about her adoption journey. And Kimberly said, wow, we're really thinking about adoption. And you know, I kind of looked at her and she said, yeah, we we are really struggling and not able to get pregnant. And so I said, wow, we are in the same struggle and not able to get pregnant either. And Kimberly is, is a little bit older. She's younger than I am, but also got married a little bit later in life. So, you know, our stories track in many ways. And so we just started sharing with each other about our individual infertility struggles. And that was the first time that I had spoken to another woman who was also dealing with infertility. And so I had shared it with a couple close girlfriends and my immediate family, but I really didn't even talk about it with my extended family. Again, because of that 
sort of shame that I felt. And, you know, you talked a moment ago, Lindy, about uncovering these rocks. And I think we need to uncover those, those rocks, uncover those lies that the devil tries to implant in us. I think he likes to push our buttons and he likes to stoke the fire of the lie that I wouldn't be a good mother, that, you know, I'm not worthy, that God is withholding a gift from me. And so those are the kinds of feelings that I had. And now I was able to share that with Kimberly. And she said, yes, I felt the same things. I have felt jealous or I've felt angry or, you know, it's caused this sort of conflict in my marriage. And so that was really uh, amazing to me to be able to share with another woman who understood how I felt. And so we remained in contact over the next uh, probably year or two. Um, and whenever we would talk, we would talk about how there was really sort of nothing, no support that, that we could find for people who are on this infertility journey. Of course, there are treatments, there is charting, there's NAPRO technology, there's all of these beautiful ways to help restore our health and our fertility, but there was nothing that would spiritually uplift or accompany us. And we sort of kept saying to each other, you know, someone really ought to do something. Somebody ought to create a ministry. And again, maybe this is the Holy Spirit's sense of humor once again, after however many times we said that, we kind of said, well, maybe we should do it. Mm -hmm. And so we began with a website and a blog and we thought, well, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe one or two people will read it and get something out of it. And what ended up happening is that we were getting responses from women all over the country and eventually all over the world who were saying, you are speaking my language. You are expressing the emotions that I have. You know, thank you. Thank you for saying all of this. Thank you for helping me to know that I'm not alone. And so that is really how Springs in the Desert was born with a blog and I guess on a wing and a prayer. And, mm -hmm. um, and since then, we've been able to gather this beautiful uh, team, a core team of, of six women, some husbands as well, who are beginning to do some ministry with, with men, um, and a whole team of contributors. And, um, it's really been such a blessing to be able to accompany, to walk with people who are on all different parts of this path. Some of them are still trying to conceive. Some of them are nearing the end of childbearing and everything in between. And it's been such a privilege to receive their stories and, and to receive their tears and to receive their gratitude, telling us that they are just so grateful to have people who understand them. Many of them don't have support from their own families even. And just to have a place that, that feels safe where they can open their hearts and where they can begin to walk on the path of healing that Jesus um, wants for all of us. Thank you for sharing that. And you said on a wing and a prayer, and I thought, and a call, yeah. a call in your own heart. And by saying yes, and by the two of you creating Springs in the Desert and accompanying all of these other women or marriages through infertility, how has that continued to heal your own heart? And how has new life come to you? So- I was probably a year and a half into this ministry. Okay, I'm the co-founder of an infertility ministry, and yet um, there was still so much healing that had to happen inside of me. And it was only about a year or so in that I acknowledged that I was grieving my infertility um, because I didn't think I had a right to, to that grief because I had never been pregnant, what had I lost? And so to be able, you know, through this team and also through all of the women and the couples that we have been accompanying, you know, my eyes began to be opened 
to my own grief and my own struggle and the validity of that and and the value of my sorrow that it's real and that God knows it and he sees it. And so um, once that happened and I could really acknowledge that, then I was able to open up my heart so that God could begin to heal it. I think I still remained closed. And I mean, it sounds silly, but even though, you know, it's, it's 11 years now that, that my husband and I are married um, and we were never pregnant. And yet for so long, I still denied infertility, right? I wouldn't even say the word. And so just being able to open myself up and, and through the vulnerability of those who come to this community, um, to be vulnerable myself. And so being a part of this community, ministering to others through my own pain and my own weakness is so healing to me. And I think the fruit that has come from it is a real understanding and belief that I am a mother deep inside of me, that desire to be a mother, to nurture and to love, God has brought and is bringing to fruition. And it's a real motherhood. It's not a second best. It's just different from other ways of being a mother. And one of the most beautiful things, I think, for Kimberly and I is that our team calls us the founding mothers, the founding mamas mm. of Springs in the Desert. And the more that I do this ministry, the more I feel that. I feel a real motherly responsibility um, for everyone who comes to us with a prayer request, with an email, however they come to be a part of this community. I welcome them. We all welcome them and love them and help them, try to help them to see that God loves them so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a saying that keeps going through my head and everybody can tell that I'm aging and I don't have a good memory, but there's this saying about from our wounds we are called. Have you ever heard that before? No. Or maybe it's just something someone said recently or even in Mamas in Spirit. So I think from our wounds, we are called, but also from our call, we are healed. Because yes. what I'm hearing from you, and even in my own experience in life, not just specifically for infertility, but in saying yes to the Lord, like you and Kimberly did with Springs of the Desert, and I say this about Mamas in Spirit, is that I have been blessed and a eternal number of times over from my yes, from all of these moments of sitting with these glorious souls and all the encounters and the richness of my life, the invitation into deeper prayer and different deeper sacramental involvement in our mm -hmm. church and, and all of these different things. I have only been blessed and healed. It's just, it's the glorious work of the Lord and it's the new life that God promises us and that Jesus promises us is that everything, if we give it to God, will be resurrected. And with, often with our, our yes, with our yes, God will redeem. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see that in my life every day. For me, the healing has been incredible, but I feel like just as St. Paul talks about having that, that thorn um, that he asks the Lord to take away, I feel like I do still have this tiny thorn and ever so often it will really pinch or stab even. And I think that I've come in some ways, this, this will sound so strange probably, but I think in many ways I've come to love that thorn. And I think that it's a gift from God because although he has healed me so much he allows this tiny thorn to remain so that I will never forget. So that whenever a woman comes in tears, whenever a couple comes and is just revealing their suffering, that I can sort of go back to that thorn and I can recall, yes, I know that pain, but I also know that as you just said, 
resurrection is not only possible, but it's what God desires for us. So while I don't, I don't want infertility, it's not something that I asked for. As time goes on, I can, I can see the gift in it. And one of those gifts is that it has really drawn me outside of myself. It's helped my heart to become more open, I hope more empathetic, and more desiring of allowing other people in to walk with them, to nurture them, just to love them. Yes. And I'd love to know too, from Springs of the Desert and just from your own healing, how has that helped to transform your marriage? I think that it has brought my husband and I closer together through having to communicate with each other about how we are feeling about what the impact of infertility has had on our marriage. It took a while for that to, you know, I think for each of us in some ways, it took a while for us to be vulnerable enough to each other to do that. But it has also opened up so many other pathways of fruitfulness. So my husband is the youngest of 16. So he's got siblings that are much older than he is. And it's given us the opportunity to really help them. Some of them have health challenges. Um, you know, so it's, it's given us the freedom to be able to be with them, to care for them when, when they need it, I think in ways that would not have been possible otherwise. So it's so beautiful because my husband is not a theologian, but I think in his heart he really is because he said to me once, this is the fruitfulness that God has called us to. And so something that feels like it came just so naturally from his heart. It feels like that took me years to learn. Um, but, but I'm just so grateful that, that he has discovered that sense of his own fruitfulness as well. Yes. And, and together as a couple, that's really beautiful. And thank you for using the word vulnerability because after listening to people, for years and also from doing all of these podcasts, vulnerability is the way into the sacred heart of Jesus mm -hmm. and also into the hearts of one another. Yeah, it's scary. It's scary. But I mean, if we if we take that risk, and God took the risk first, right? I mean, in even in even creating us and in sacrificing Himself on the cross for us, because look at how easily. We can reject him and turn away from him, but he takes he takes the chance on us, so to speak, anyway. And so we we can follow him and take the chance on ourselves and on each other because Amen. such such beauty and such life can come from that. That's so beautiful. And thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here today. You have such a beautiful wisdom that you've been blessed with. And I, I appreciate you sharing it with us so much. And how can listeners get connected with the springs in the desert if they're facing or someone they love is facing infertility? Right. So they can visit our website, springsinthedesert.org. They can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, they can listen to our podcast, the Springs in the Desert podcast, which is found on most all of the um, podcasting platforms. Um, and they can email us, info at springsinthedesert.org, if they have a prayer request, if they have a question, or if they just need to get connected with someone who understands. We are here for you, and it is our honor to walk with you. Thank you so much, Anne. And Anne, would you? Oh, I have to ask you our special questions at the end of the podcast. Okay. <laughs> Do you have a favorite saint? I have a lot of spiritual friends, um, but I think over the last couple of years, uh, my most favorite has been St. Teresa of Calcutta because she said that if she were to be a saint, she, she would be a saint of darkness. And so she shows us that even in the darkest of times, the Lord is doing his work and bringing about such beautiful fruit. Amen. Amen. That's glorious. And how about a favorite prayer or scripture passage? Oh, gosh. I think one of my favorite prayers is a really ancient prayer to the mother of God. Um, 
it's called Beneath Your Compassion. And I love that because I can just imagine myself going to Mary and um, having her wrap me in her mantle, just as she wrapped the baby Jesus, you know, just as she swaddled him. And so sometimes I'll, I'll ask Mary if she will just please come and just swaddle me like she swaddled the baby Jesus. How beautiful to be in her embrace. That is so beautiful. And would you mind, can you send me that prayer so I can post it on social media? Wonderful. And will you close us in prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time to be together and to share. We thank you for the vulnerability that you have given us. Lord, pour out your mercy and your peace in our hearts for any of us who are suffering, no matter what that suffering is, Lord, pour out your presence on us. Help us to know that we are your beloved daughters, that you are always faithful to us, that even in the stillness and the silence, you are there working in our hearts and loving us. And as always, we ask everything through the intercession of our Blessed Mother Mary. Mary, take our hands, wrap us in your mantle, swaddle us, and hold us close as you did your Blessed Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And I just love being in your presence. You are just such a lovely soul. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you everyone for being here. These times are always a delight. They're healing and wondrous in a way and filled with the Holy Spirit because of these beautiful spirits. So thank you for being here and cannot wait to be together again next time. You can also spend time with Anne and I on YouTube. Mamas in Spirit has just gone to YouTube and there's video there. So you can find the podcast there as well as at mamasinspirit.com and then all the different podcast platforms. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.